Hi everyone, it's Will. Welcome to the nth uh, advanced mini Canron Hangout. Last week we talked a little bit about, um, or Evan talked a little bit about, you know, using neural nets to help guide mini Canron search. So today Evan's going to uh, talk about and maybe give us a little bit of walkthrough or demo of the the code that he's he's written to experiment with that and maybe talk a little bit about what he's learned. And uh, maybe that will lead to to more discussion about uh, neural nets and mini chem search, or maybe not, I don't know. And we can just go from there. And if that's all we have to talk about and it's short, that's fine, no, no worries. Uh, we'll just see where it goes. Okay, Evan, you're up. All right, so. <clears throat> Uh, basically, what I've been working on is uh, one of, I think, probably several different approaches to uh, adding some kind of machine learning uh, dimension to a mini Canron search. And the particular way that I have it set up, you can basically think about as trying to uh, learn some kind of reasonable prior or bias over all the different possible programs that, you know, in, in this case, for example, Barlaman could be coming up with such that it will know that certain kinds of combinations like, you know, as one of the things we've talked about a lot in the past is uh, stacking nested lambdas with lots of unused arguments that just, you know, you can kind of keep adding arguments to lambdas that don't actually change the program execution or, at all or anything like that. So being able to learn that certain sorts of steps like from one lambda to a longer but you know, still identical lambda are not that helpful and you know cut all of those out you know sort of put those way down at the bottom of the stack at the beginning so that you spend all of your search time doing useful things uh, rather than sort of running in circles that you know are what suck up a lot of the, the time that it spends uh, not come up with good answers uh, and I haven't uh, you know that that part I have a kind of a, a very preliminary uh, miniature sort of demo version of that is sort of like you know a proof of concept for all of the relevant ideas that I think will be uh, useful in in setting up something like that that really kind of realizes that goal. Uh, I will add to that that you can you know and I haven't sort of done this per se yet, but this seems to be a very direct extension of that is that not only can you imagine this as learning a, a prior over you know, the whole space of just general scheme programs or whatever your, uh, your particular setup is, but you could also imagine conditioning it on, for example, the inputs and outputs that you would give to a synthesis system. So you know if you, all your inputs and outputs are lists, then you know, things like cons and, and car and stuff will probably be you know, better choices than plus and then kind of random things that don't generally go along with lists. And so you can kind of, in that way, make it more than just a general prior and pretend more fine grained stuff, but that's a little bit out in the future. A general uh, context for, for this is that uh, I'm trying to get it to, aiming at it being a mini Canron level op operation rather than a, did we lose? Oh, he's there. It's lost video. Uh, aiming at it being a mini Canron level option operation rather than a specifically bar lemon or some other specific application level operation so that ideally anything you write in mini Canron can be trained in the kind of the same process sort of automatically is the goal. Uh, Will, are you still there? Yep, I'm still here. Yep, I'm still here. Sorry. Okay. Uh, so let's see here. So the code I have is kind of, you know, very much just, you know, very recently got it working, uh, hasn't, haven't yet had time to kind of pat, repackage it all up. So it's kind of split across several versions. And I think I've worked out which is which, but we may discover that something, need a second to figure out where something is. But with that said, I'm going to share screen here and show a few things. And you can feel free to, to jump in if you want to, you know, back up some context or something for some other people since I didn't, I'm not, you know, everyone has a different take. It, it, it being in small talk and it being kind of in a very different mini Canon context, that it, it may, there may need to be some additional context that I can add as I'm going. So feel free to jump in with that. So going to try a screen share here. Alrighty. <clears throat> See that? 
I do. I do. All right. So let's see here. Let's way to do this. Okay. So <clears throat> there are. Let me just figure out which window I'm in here. Right, so there are two basic, well, sort of, well, let's go with three basic components. I'm going to add up, bring up the other window first. Three basic sort of general components to this. Yeah. Uh, so the first component is that the way this is going to work is that every uh, mini Canron package that you get back as an answer from some program is going to have, in addition to a substitution and constraint store, uh, an additional component that is a representation of what I guess I'll call the execution trace, the path through the various freshes and, and condies and whatnot that we took to get to that answer. And the qualification there is that every uh, distinct answer from any given mini Canron program should have a distinct trace, and that similar answers should have similar traces in some sense, which is why we can do any kind of meaningful learning at all uh, because you know an answer that is we are sort of operating under the assumption that that you know any any reasonable space in which we want to learn is well enough behaved that an answer that is you know used all the same condies used all the same but bound all the same variables and only changed in one respect will as a a, a basic guess be about as good an answer as one that has uh, just differed in one in small, like you know, the last condi or something like this. Let me signal and interrupt. What's uh, that? We, uh, okay, so your your screen was garbled. It, it just became okay now. Oh, okay, good. Well, I wasn't showing anything, but it's fine. Okay, <laughs> I was just talking. Uh, so, what I let's see about this. So, for so to give an example of that, here's uh, a test of you know a simple kind of interpreter lifted from the Quine paper that's evaluating uh, a list of a quoted one. And you can read this as so. Here's the the list program, and here's the quoted one, and here's uh, I guess the two element list of a quoted one and a quoted two. Right, so this return list of one two. Uh, specifically, it should return this, and then, <clears throat> and uh, so if I run that program and get back the package, I can access it, the the execution trace for it, which I've tree traced here is this sort of pretty printed version, hopefully, which is. You know, all, uh, basically the program starts with the you know, outer level of eval. The numbers are like which branch of a condi it selected. Uh, then apparently it goes into the list functions. So that's the third condi list, proper list. Uh, and then it goes into the, you know, that it's not an empty list. And then we get, you know, this is, this uh, trade, execution trace has the form of a tree structure. Uh, and so we get the first branching here where one branch goes through eval down to quote. So that must be the first uh, quoted value, the one. The second branch goes down uh, through a proper list, not an empty list again, eval quote. And so that's the second quoted value. And then the final branch is outside of both of those and it goes down through proper list and stops there. So that's the, the, term, the uh, terminal nil in the list. Uh, so basically, the execution trace is a tree that that closely mirrors the uh, program structure by sort of tracing out the path of execution. Does that make sense so far? I think so. I, I can't read. I mean, I can read. I think this version, the the last one, I couldn't quite make sense of of sort of the the notation. But I, okay, so this is the trace for this for a successful coin generation, right? Uh, yeah, and, I, didn't, it, it, I didn't generate a quine, but I, you know, I generated like a list of two elements. But this is the trace for that. I just used the quine interpreter. Oh, I see. Okay. Okay. Uh, so if you um, uh, can you generate traces of things that fail or give you answers that aren't expected, would that be useful for training? I can. I can. Uh, so so basically, the way it works right now is that I can any uh, package that comes back 
as an answer. So if I want answers that aren't expected, I have to remove any constraints that are you know, constraining it to be only answers that I wanted. Uh, and I'm not doing anything with, with failures internally. And so it's basically only the answers you get back can be trained on. And so to get negative examples, you sort of need a, a larger space of returned answers that include uh, negative examples, which is indeed, I think, a, a part of the plan to use something like that. But uh, part of part of the way that I've set this up is that it's a sort of you know three-step process. You, you know, I'm still working on the details of exactly what the best way. I think there are a number of possible options to do the sort of the whole meta stra training strategy. But you run it on a bunch of of programs, or you let it generate its own programs, or whatever, so that you get a bunch of traces. You run some arbitrary machine learning model on those traces to figure out what are good traces, what are bad traces, that kind of thing. And then you plug that machine learning model back into the search and let it guide the search to you know, find new answers or find answers you know, down the line uh, more quickly because it's already trained on a bunch of stuff. So it's not doing kind of online updating during the search from failures and things like that. I think in principle there might be a way to do that, but I haven't figured out a kind of a good, consistent strategy uh, that made use of that information at this at this point. Okay, so uh, I know there are several people here who have experienced neural nets and deep learning and so forth. Is it is it the um, current view of things that the online learning is better, or at least with something like AlphaGo, the sense I got was that the, they did a huge amount of training. You know, before the game, uh, and and that in some sense it maybe wasn't online, mm -hmm. but uh, I, I don't know if if you know if some having some online learning component is is important for for these techniques. Mm -hmm. I think a lot has to do with how one imagines deploying this, and it's sort of you know a chicken and the egg problem. Like if you can figure out how to use different kinds of information, you can imagine different kinds of deployments as to whether you're training it a bunch and then end users all just use the trained model, whether you know it can be training while it's seeing its first example and you know, it doesn't have to be trained on things like it in the past. Like a lot of the the open questions I think for me at this point are really of the form of, of what exactly is the kind of end scenario that we're aiming at and sort of doing it this way enables a few and you know makes a few less obvious that, that they can sort of fit in this model. Uh, but it seems that there's kind of a lot of options here and a lot of sort of open uh, room to, to think about, I guess. OK. I, I guess one way also to uh, to generate answers that aren't the ones we want is just through the relational interpreter and having a knot wrapped around the predicate we use. Or you know, there, there may be ways like that, uh, which we've thought about using for testing, mm -hmm. uh, for generating uh, tests for fuzz testing, that kind of thing, where Mm -hmm. We've got enough expressive power in a relational interpreter that maybe we can you know, just just make a simple change like that and get different properties. I think part of it too is sort of like recognizing how sort of sort of like a, a distinction between you know the structure of the interpreter and you know the constraints that places on the returned answers versus the sort of constraints that you know input output pairs and things like that add to any given subsequent trace. So sort of like a lot of the different stages at which we're constraining this space here. And I do think that you know it's sort of because Mini Canarin is is so uh, sort of centrally good at generating structures according to arbitrary specifications that making use of that uh, to generate things like you know positive and negative examples and explore different spaces is sort of a central part of what I had in mind as a kind of the basic strategy here. And the way that I've been thinking about it, which is not the only way I think to, to set it up, is that, okay, uh, if we can think about a general space of programs uh, over and above programs that are constrained to, you know, be the append function or be the, you know, whatever else function, uh, then you can sort of hope to learn by having some kind of way to evaluate that a program that is, you know, larger but doesn't seem to produce any different results is worse than a program that's like shorter and seems to produce the same results or something like this. Uh, you can have it explore kind of an unconstrained space of programs and learn very general biases about useless lambdas and things like that that should help all kinds of different 
actual programs you want to generate. And hopefully that will make generating things like append or any specific program faster. OK. Uh, so moving on then, uh, so the first stage is like, you know, having these traces that are sort of unique and, and have structure that can be uh, learned in some sense. Uh, then the, and uh, so switching over to a different window here, uh, the next step would be just sort of, you know, defining and training some machine learning model on those tree traces, which are just, you know, sort of trees of symbols from some very, you know, specific finite set of, of symbols that we can potentially extract beforehand or, or potentially sort of use on the fly depending on what you need to do. You have just some very general machine learning, you know, of any of whatever kind uh, process that can operate mostly independently of the fact that this is coming out of, you know, mini Canon or whatever, which should make it easier to try, I think, integrating different, different options here. Uh, so uh, this is an example from a newer version I was just showing a sort of from an older version that happened to have better facilities for printing those traces. Here's a newer version that has the actual sort of uh, machine learning going on where, uh, so this is uh, for people who maybe are not as familiar with the, the small tack, small talk uh, version of mini Canron syntax. This is this square brackets here is basically a fresh and up to this bar are the arguments. So it's a fresh for just X. And then this is a, uh, Double uh, curly braces there is condi, and so it's basically a condi of a fresh variable being unified with one and being unified with two, just like the simplest possible like program in which a decision can be made at all, right? And so if we just run that program uh, on its own, the first answer that comes out uh, is going to be the variable bound to two, just because of you know whatever the bouncing back and forth the order of how this tree gets built is. And so what we have here is basically uh, we take, you know, we sort of one and two here, we take the traces out uh, from those two answers. We build here a very simple kind of RNN, and I just sort of flatten the tree into a, you know, a sort of a linear sequence of symbols that I can just feed to a standard kind of character modeling, like predict the next characters type of RNN uh, model. And I uh, run that here, and I'm not sort of going into that because it's all just sort of, you know, I'm not, not specifically related to mini Canron, just to code that would be something else in a different context. And then here we have this uh, trained uh, model that we're getting back from the solver, and we just build a special sort of, you know, wrapper around it for mini Canron, and we run G as our, our goal up there. We run the same goal and feed it this model. And the first answer we get out uh, from there has the variable bound to one instead of two. So basically, I was just saying uh, we're going to train it to prefer uh, the one path to the two path, and just sort of you know, in you know, next run it will it will start with the one rather than the two. And this if this was you know a more complicated program, it would be sort of you know, preferring lots of different paths. Uh, there's only one path for it to prefer right now. Does that make sense? Uh, okay, so why is it preferring one over two? Uh, just because I made the arbitrary decision to give the one path a score of one and the two path a score of zero, and trained it okay. to for all the things on the path to two. Uh, and so that's basically what the model does, is it just, uh, see what we have here. Yeah, so I'm feeding in the data here, which I've just comp just sort of made that the trace of one is the training example input, and the value of one is the sort of score, whereas the trace of two has an input, has the score of zero. And so it's just saying, you know, learn a very, very simple model that uh, prefers everything on the path to one to everything on the path to two. And so that, you know, when we evaluate it next, it will just go to one before it'll go to two. Okay, so would you ever get a two out of the model? Yeah, it comes out next. It just doesn't come out first. Okay, okay. So that kind of blows my my. I I don't. I, I guess I have this idea that we have like this probabilistic model where 
we'll get some percentage of ones and some percentage of twos, but this is seems like more like it's a numer. Oh, this is because it's based on the search reordering. Is that what it's doing? Yeah, it's just reordering the search. Okay. Okay, so this isn't like a probabilistic model. It's not like you're querying it and it's going to give you one back with some probability, two back with some probability. Rather, it's just regular mini Canron search, but you reordered the conjuncts, or sorry, the disjuncts right. uh, based on how you've done learning. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, basically. And I mean, it's not, it's, I mean, I would have to think more about the implications of a phrase like reorder the, the uh, disjuncts. But because basically what it's doing is, and this is, I guess, what I'll, I'll get into next because it's the next logical piece anyway. Uh, so the first step was generating these trees, right, and sort of making sure the traces like made sense and were unique and stuff. And then we trained some model that just, you know, like some trace trees better than other trace trees and like knows how to give them scores relative to one another. And the final piece of this is just changing, and like none of this requires a great deal of change to the basic way Mini Camera works. This is all stuff that you could sort of add without too too much uh, difficulty, I think, uh, to any sort of standard Mini Camera model because it's like all the stuff's just the same. You just kind of need to thread this extra trace thing through, and then thread the model through and use it to as you build the search tree. Because what it's really doing is, uh, you know, our search. If you think of the search tree as, you know, a big uh, sort of, you know, binary tree where all of the leaves are some partial state, some goals that have not yet been explored and stuff like that, then it basically, when the normal mini Canron stream code goes to do its, its sort of standard interleaving M plus thing, this basically just checks the score of the two things getting M plus and, you know, for example, uh, puts the max one first rather than just the one that wasn't first before. Does that make sense? Uh, maybe. It's just a small. So so you know. Uh, so it's just a small change to how you build up the stream that you return from every kind of step of the search. Okay. Rather than uh, just flipping the order of the streams like you do in the normal mini Canon search, which is what gives it its interleaving property, you yeah. go to flip the order of the streams, but before you flip the order, you check the scores of the two streams, uh, and whichever has the bigger score, you put that first instead of necessarily flipping the order. So, so is this like an M plus? Yeah, somewhere around there. Somewhere well, somewhere uh, analogous to there in the, the small talk code. OK, so Greg asks, it turns the disjunction tree into a priority queue? Basically, yeah, and you could make the decision deterministically like I'm doing right now, you could make it probabilistically, uh, which would sort of potentially have implica implications for how completeness works depending on how your model, you know, whether your model would uh, be a problem for that. OK. So so when, when I asked if effectively you're reordering the Condi clauses, you, you said you had to think about that you know, sort of characterization um, yeah, so so I guess what's the difference if if you do it deterministically, what's the difference between making this junction tree a priority queue versus sort of the equivalent of on the fly textually reordering a condi? Is that are they kind of equivalent? Um I'm I'm not I'm not sure because I mean I don't have a, a clear enough vision of, of how the of what the sort of the condi reordering would do. But for instance uh, kind of my intuition, intuitively, I might kind of start uh, thinking about that by basically saying that, you know, if we have, you know, some initial condi and its left branch has a really high score and its right branch or, you know, some other branches don't have a very high score, then we can kind of potentially be staying at that, on that half of the search tree for, for a while. Uh, and so it's sort of like, whereas I might imagine, you know, my my kind of guess for how Condi reordering would look, and this may not be at all how it works because I haven't implemented it, so I don't have a good sense for it. But uh, would be that if we, you know, re, you know, come to this Condi, we can re, we can you know put the the same Condi, for example, like the the first Condi we encounter has two arguments say uh, that if we we can reorder it however we want, but when we put the left branch first it will still 
put the right branch as the next thing it expands after it expands the first branch, if that makes sense. Rather than in this version, the children of that left branch may come before the right branch of the parent. Okay. Uh, so Greg says, you know, one difference between uh, destruction trees prior to Q versus uh, reordering Condi clauses might be static versus dynamic, you know, reordering at runtime. He says, I could imagine sub goals of a particular Condi clause affecting the weights as they're unraveled. Sub goals of a particular Condi clause affecting the weights. They will affect the weights, they will affect the accumulated weights of the subtrees that they. That they sort of add back into the queue. Uh, if I'm not doing online learning, it shouldn't change any of the other already calculated weights elsewhere in the in the tree. I don't. I mean, if I'm understanding correctly. Okay. So for a nested recursive Kundi, does that have? I uh, guess as you go to. If the parent has a bad score, it will not expand for a while as like everything else in the tree moves around and only kind of after you've exhausted all the other possibilities will its children get a chance to uh, to sort of play. And you know, maybe the children will turn a very bad score into a very large score, but like, you know, that that's sort of you know a risk you're taking when you're saying that you're doing learning. We hopefully have learned that, you know to predict when a good score is coming down the path. <laughs> okay. Well, I've got some sense of it. I don't think I completely 100% understand, but uh, uh, is this a, a neural net package that you wrote, or is this something that's um, available in Smalltalk? Uh, I, just something I wrote. but. It will soon be available in Smalltalk as well. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, so Lisa and Greg have questions here. Uh, Lisa's I'm probably several steps behind, but the RNN takes a trace, tree encoded as a sequence, and outputs a score. Is that right? Yeah. And then scores possible next steps of the trace. Is that right? <clears throat> Basically, yeah. Uh, I mean, yes, I think that's right as far as it goes. Just to, as a clarification, uh, I you know because I mean this may not even be this may be how people are thinking about it already, but just because it was too, it seemed to be like two different things uh, for me when I was writing it is that it's right now it doesn't you know it's sort of it's using. A given condi kind of expands to all its children and uses those and just sort of gives those scores as the sort of next steps. And so all, all of the current current uh, partial you know states in the tree are kind of the next steps of things. But I mean, I, I don't know if that made any sense, but but it's also not that important. But yeah, so but conceptually, yeah, that, that's that's what it's doing. It, it takes the trace uh, of every every kind of current partial state. Uh, and gives it a score, and then that score is what the the priority queue uses to figure out uh, what to expand next. Uh, Greg asks, when a recursive condi is finally expanded, does its children enter the parent's priority queue? Do the you know do the children enter the parent's priority queue? Hmm. So uh, let's see. The priority to the extent that so so the priority queue right now is basically if you think about the uh, sort of search tree quote unquote that is currently implicit in all of the delayed uh, you know lambda expressions that form the the lazy stream that you're getting back, but if you kind of reify that out as a, as the full tree where you have a bunch of binary kind of uh, nodes with nothing at them and then all the leaves are the Current actual states with you know substitutions and and goals and all that stuff that are kind of waiting to expand. Then what it basically does is that when you expand, let's say the leftmost 
uh, child, which would be kind of analogous to the first uh, element of the stream, then it uh, takes that, generates the next, all the next sort of, you know, elements of the stream, uh, which if it's, you know, a, like a, a, a lazy, like, like, a, like a fresh or something will just be one element, or if it's a condi, it might be more than one element joined together. Uh, then it will score all of the things that it generates, uh, whether it's one or two or whatever. And then when it, you know, builds the next stage of the tree, which is going to be a kind of, you know, an, an immutable, sort of functional uh, tree kind of add of the part of the old tree and of the, the new subtree, then it sort of rec recurses down and at every step where it's sort of creating a new binary sort of parent node for two subtrees, it checks the left and right subtrees sort of score as cached from this model. And so all of the children of any expanded node should basically kind of bubble up to wherever in the tree they belong. So I don't think they're bound in any way by, by where the parent was in any sense, aside from the fact that they inherited the parent's substitution and, and you know, accumulate the parent's score as per the, the learning strategy, if that, if that answers the question. So like the parents themselves don't have priority cues in the way that I'm thinking about it. There's just sort of one global priority queue that is the search tree. Okay, would, would it make sense to break things up into different priority queues? Like, would that even be a meaningful concept, or could you could, could you structure the code? I don't know. I, I would have to, someone would have to tell me how that would work, because I don't, it, it doesn't mean anything to me uh, offhand, but, you know, maybe I, you know, I'd, I, I'm certainly open to the idea that there's some other way to do this that I just doesn't happen to hasn't happened to occur to me. Uh, so Greg says, so if a recursive condi is expanded and some of its clauses have low scores and others high, the low scores will stay low in the queue. Yes. The high scores will rise up and possibly surpass some of the parents' peers. Yeah, question. and that's the good thing, right? That's basically sort of trusting the learning algorithm to know where the path is independently of how the sort of search is structured. Mm, okay, so uh, let me see if I understand this because I don't think I'm following everything here. <laughs> um, so th is the idea that if you had nested condi clauses, um, well, oh, okay, so, so is this the problem that we're talking about is that, you know, say you had a condi clause and each of the condi clauses have nested condi clauses, um, I guess the problem is you're trying to avoid, you know, some some really high probability clause that's deeply nested in one of the condies from basically never being run because because its sibling clauses have low scores. Is that the idea? You're sort of like promoting it in some sense. Uh, yeah. I mean, uh, <clears throat> it's basically tr exchanging. Basically, the, the, the high-level bargain you're making is that you exchange the default interleaving property of the search for whatever your machine learning model thinks the search should be. And it's going to pick you know, the next best place to go from anywhere in the tree, no matter, you know, like comparing across all programs. So like if you have you know, two totally different programs forming in different, you know, very different branches of the search, they'll each get a score, and whichever one is the best overall program according to your model is what it will expand next and keep looking down that tree until it accumulates uh, enough sort of cost, basically, that it says, okay, well, I've explored this a lot, and it's getting less and less likely because I'm not finding an answer, and all the, I'm adding all these things that are like low probability. Let's switch back to that other thing I had a while ago and keep looking there. So it's, it's basically totally changing the interleaving property, although currently uh, I sort of leave that as the default for when scores are equal, uh, and trusting that your model has has a, a better idea of how to do this than the sort of the default way. Okay, and and with your original pro, uh, deterministic version, you're not losing completeness of the search. So I so I, what I think will be the case is if in the deterministic version, uh, you know, you could conceivably 
like I, I, I suppose like I, I think it will still be complete because I think that what will happen is that if you go down some infinite branch, even if for whatever reason your model thinks it's a very good infinite branch, uh, you basically accumulate the score or the cost in this, if we want to think about it this way, with every sort of expansion you make. So even a very good branch will eventually accumulate enough score that it should lose to a very sort of bad branch initially that's much less expanded. Uh, but that's that's sort of a property of the particular model I've picked. You could pick a model that doesn't lose as it expands, in which case maybe if your model makes a very bad decision and keeps on making that bad decision, then it will just run forever and not be complete or something. Uh, but okay. so I think it's a little bit of an interplay with like exactly what you what your model does, but I think you can still keep it by choosing like reasonable models that satisfy that property. So, so if you did something like in that first model you showed where you had a, a score or a weight of zero or something like that, you might end up with some degenerate behavior if you pick zero as a value. Yeah, and like, so one other, and this is sort of, you know, gets into a question of like exactly where the model ends and where Mini Canron begins. So like the model, like the current model I'm using is sort of accumulating that score. You could also imagine a model that just gives a kind of a flat score and then make a probabilistic choice which will get you back some of the completeness, right? Because even if it keeps giving an infinite branch a good score, like eventually it'll just randomly not pick that. Uh, but that's also kind of a modeling choice that's that's a flexible. Uh, but yeah, like in, in both of those cases, if like you know, if, if, if zeros and ones are entering your probabilistic computation rather than like point oh oh ones and point oh oh nines, then then you're probably hosed either way. But that's that's presumably something that you try to avoid at the modeling level. Okay. Uh, Lisa says, it sounds like you've structured the traces as a tree, or the trace as a tree, which contains both successful and unsuccessful branches. How are the unsuccessful branches used in training? What's the rationale for having it? Uh, so right now, the tree structure, so, so, so okay, so, so I think what, what it makes sense to do then is to talk a little bit about what that tree structure is, which I, I go into some some more detail in the email, but I've also glossed over in my sort of presentation here. Uh, so let's see if I can grab the best way to, to demonstrate this. Okay, so let's talk about this tree trace here. So every trace comes back with a, a sort of a final answer that is returned by the Mini Canron program as if you were using the run macro, right? So every trace represents a kind of satisfying solution of for you know from your interpreter or whatever, and in that respect, it doesn't it doesn't actually contain any information from I think anything that you should would would want to call a failed branch. Its branches describe are just sort of used here to describe in sort of more uh, more detail I think than a linear representation the successful return. Uh, and so the way to think about that is, I think, in an, for some reason, so I got, I kind of came to this from thinking about it as like natural language parsing trees. Uh, but I guess a, a much more obvious analogy that only kind of occurred to me like yesterday is to think about Mini Canron as a prologue program and sort of, you know, what we, you know, because it makes it a little clearer what the structure that I'm using is if we think about it as these kind of like head body. Uh, kind of context-free rules, rather than uh, you know, sort of like I mean, it made it clear to me to think about it that way, rather than the sort of you know thinking about it as the sort of functional uh, you know functions calling recursive functions type of thing. So what I mean by that is basically I'm going to sort of type pseudocode here. We can think of our interpret like the Quine interpreter as having a kind of you know grammar which is not sort of a, a fully you know, you know, it, it does not capture all the information that is in the interpreter, but we can approximate it with a sort of a context-free grammar uh, of like eval goes to quote, and I'm using capitals here for rule for non-terminals. Uh, quote goes to little quote, which is like the actual change of of state of you know a, returning a a quoted value or something like this. Eval goes to look up look up goes to, you know, failed look up 
and then look up again because it calls itself. And this is sort of all just basically being taken directly out of the literal functional structure of you know, the condies and the recursive calls in the program, if that makes sense. And so the reason this rule exists is because lookup does something and calls lookup, right? And lookup can also let's do success lookup. So does that does the analogy that I'm getting at here make sense with sort of you know eval is a function that contains this sort of a call to quote, uh, and a call to lookup, and a call to other things. Quote is a function that just sort of contains this return value, which is like do something that isn't call another uh, function. Lookup calls itself and also just sort of succeeds. Does that make sense? Um. I'm not sure if it makes sense to me. Maybe it makes sense to Lisa. Does that make sense, to Lisa? <laughs> I don't I understand part of this, but I don't really understand all of it. Lisa's also got a couple other questions, and I'm not sure which order they're in now, because I'm not sure if the latest question was in response to what you just showed. All right, well, uh, let's see here. So the second one, second one first. Okay. Uh, the second one being, does the RNN have, uh, does that mean the RNN would be learning the same behavior? Is that the second one? Let me hold on. Let me find my okay right here. Okay, yeah. So, so does that mean the RNN would be learning the same behavior that the current system already has, or behaviors they have? Uh, so the RNN is basically learning a bias over the search tree, uh, which is a sort of an infinitely expanding set of frontier nodes. And it's just learning how to how to prioritize that that search frontier based on the sort of history of that search. And so the RNN itself doesn't have any machinery to actually generate programs or do any of the like the interesting things that the actual you know fact of having a relational interpreter does. It's just learning how to kind of await the search strategy for the relational interpreter or for whatever the mini canon program is uh, based on learning what good you know, traces of that program uh, look like and what bad ones tend to look like. Uh, another question. Also, how do you envision <coughs> conditioning on the goal, the particular program that you're trying to synthesize? Uh, in the sense of like, you know, given that we've given, you know, it, the inputs and outputs for append, using that information to get append rather than other useful functions. Right, so that's a little, I have some ideas about that. If there's a, a little bit of a gray area there. Uh, the, the answer kind of has two parts. The first part is that, uh, one, I'm hoping that a general bias over like useless programs versus programs that do things will at least cut out a bunch of stuff that we don't then need to search through uh, and make you know whatever actual program you're searching for faster, assuming you're not searching for degenerate programs that do nothing. Uh, but then within that, I think we can do better uh, basically by finding a way to encode uh, the, the input you know, for example, we'll just say we have something that, you know, like another RNN that encodes the input uh, output pairs as a vector and then use that as a, uh, a starting uh, vector rather than zero in the sort of the decoder RNN that is guiding this search. Uh, and uh, in order to get vectors out of input and output pairs, uh, my thought is that first of all, if you have, you know, things like uh, a pair of input and outputs that are lists or, you know, trees or, you know, things made out of conses, uh, then you can basically come up with, you know, one potential option here, partial strategy, is that you would start with, and I haven't tried any of this, this is kind of like, you know, stuff to try as soon as I clean this up a bit. Uh, but my thought is that if you basically turn the input data into the canonical uh, sort of program representation, Right, so if we, uh, it's like a scratch here. If we turn, you know, a, a list uh, one, two, three here into the program, you know, this one, you know, quote, 
one, float, two, float, three, right? And then we can use the same concept of these traces we're getting from the, from the interpreter already to just run it on that and use that trace as the starting data. That still leaves, if that works as I think it does, that still leaves the actual fact that all the actual values, one, two, and three, are just these sort of anonymous, because you know, like the, 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 the interpreter ends when we do the quote. It doesn't care what we quoted. And so if we want to get more information out of like the specific numbers, I'm not actually sure whether that is useful in all contexts because a lot of the, you know, a lot of the time these will just be like, you know, gen sims that don't, there's no meaningful structure to them one way or another because you're just defining a, a function that operates on list structures or something like that. But if we need to go further than that, then, then I have some kind of vague ideas about that, but that kind of gets into stuff that's, that's comparatively less clearly defined than, than the sort of the general strategy here of just reusing the interpreter traces, if that makes sense. So, so does that mean you're using some, you would use some sort of canonical form of the programs to learn on? I kind of thought you would just sort of turn the, you know, the, the list and cons into just sort of a, you know, a program that used list and cons and, and whatnot instead of, uh, and just use that. I mean, alternatively, you could write, you know, because this, because the traces are, are coming out of mini Canron, not Barlaman, any input that you can write a generator for in mini Canron will just give you traces that represent the things it generated, right? So, so you can write an arbitrary mini Canron program that just does it generates scheme data or something like this. You know, you know, it does it differently than the, using the interpreter, and that would work too. I think if, if one works, then they both should work. I think. Okay, so uh, trying to understand this. So, so if I start writing a partial program that's not in your canonicalized form, uh, does that would that cause any problems? A partial. You know, oh, well, like in other words, if I did like you can do in Barlaman, where I fill in part of the structure, right? But right. there, um, is maybe using quote one two list one two three right. instead no, of any problem. So this this would be a strategy only for the input output pairs, and mm -hmm. you would use the partial program the same way you normally do as just an extra constraint, so that part of the tree, you know, just you know, basically you know it works because all the 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 RNN here is doing is biasing the search. If you add like a big constraint, like a partial program, then it will just never bother scoring or searching the things that are not consistent with that constraint anyway, and will start, you know, scoring the frontier of the actual like wherever your free variables appear, like like it kind of does normally. So that would work the same way it does in normal mini Canron. This would just be for the fact that, you know, basically the the at issue here is that we have the structure of the interpreter, which is generating these traces. Right, and then we have this input data, which acts as a constraint on the space of the interpreter, but doesn't change the the like doesn't expand the space of the interpreter. Right, you can't put in input output pairs that generate programs that the interpreter couldn't have generated without those input output pairs. Right, if you run the interpreter forever, it generates all possible you know variants on, on all possible programs. Uh, so 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 basically the issue, and then this is kind of what made you know using failure as and this, perhaps this gets back a little bit to the question we started with here it's like how how one might use failure this gets back partly back to why i haven't been able to think of a consistent way to use failure as an information source is that you know what fails during a pend may not fail during synthesizing you know map or something like this uh, and we are in fact learning a bias that we want to be able to use in different under different sets of constraints that may generate different failures, even though those don't actually, you know, those may not change, you know, like, or, you know, like maybe they do, maybe they don't. I, I don't have a clear vision of how to incorporate that perspective into using failure as an information signal, right? Because if failure, like the kind of the, the obvious thing is like, oh, well, it failed down this branch, that must not be a good branch. And if you're doing like online learning, uh, then maybe there's something to that. But if you're learning across different runs, then it's harder to say whether failure in the earlier case was actually a failure you would experience in the later case, right? Or like, but, but maybe, I don't yeah. know. Okay. <clears throat> so, so maybe you learned on append, and now you're trying to learn map, and you know, passing in a function to append is hopeless, or something like that, or making yeah. 
you know, cause in certain contexts or is hopeless, but that's exactly what we need to, to do for a map. Right, and that's why I was trying to get at it by doing the sort of the pre-encoding of just the input-output pairs, but not the partial program, right? Because the partial program is kind of, well, I mean, <clears throat> but basically that, that, you know, that's what I was trying to get at with doing the encoding of the input-output pairs, because that's potentially something we can use to bias the search across those two different runs and actually change the search behavior while still kind of letting it you know, fail wherever it needs to fail, I guess, not interpreting failure as some specific thing, if that makes sense. Because we'll, we'll have learned the bias under the context where it was failing in the appropriate places for that function or something like that. Okay. <clears throat> uh, let me see, so what was I saying? I was talking about the the grammar version of of Mini Kenrin to, to I was describing the sort of what the traces are, right? And maybe make sense to try to finish that thought if I can, uh, and figure out where I left that. Oh, there it is. Uh, so basically, let's see here. So what, what this is basically, at the, the highest level, uh, I'm basically saying let's extract a grammar from the call structure of the different sort of functions in the interpreter, right? The, the different things that may be called recursively kind of elsewhere in the interpreter. And so the fact that lookup, you know, it calls lookup and it sort of terminates with a success means that we'll have a rule in which lookup appears on the left and right, lookup appears on the left and right, and a rule in which lookup appears on the left, but then there's just non-terminals on the right. Does that make sense? Uh, maybe? Just from the fact that lookup is a function that says either the current variable is, you know, matches what we were looking up and we were done, or it does not match, and let's call lookup on the next, the cutter of the, environment and, and recurse, right? Yeah, I get that part. And so this is just, yeah, you know, this, I mean, maybe this isn't clarifying anything. This is just kind of me clarifying for myself, but maybe it just makes direct sense <laughs> to other people that um, sort of, you know, just using that from, just from that fact, kind of sketching this as an approximate way to sort of think about the call structure as this, this sort of grammar here, but I don't know, maybe Maybe that only makes it clearer to me, and it doesn't actually isn't actually necessary. So maybe I'll just move on and see if it makes sense. Uh, so that that's like the one thing that I do understand is that part, uh -huh. I guess, because I've written like ten thousand programs that look like that. Right, right. Uh, and I mean, yeah, and, and and so the reason for my uh, saying this is just to sort of start seeing because because I was sort of thinking about this as a natural language parse, where you know, or you know, or any parse, right, because they're all parses, but I just happen to be more familiar with it in the context of natural language parsing, uh, uh, where basically what you are returning as a trace uh, is something that has to encode, you know, the sort of the sequence of decisions we made. And I, the reason I kind of, I, I was initially, like, the obvious thing for a trace to be is just like a sequence. Right, like we kind of, mm -hmm. you know, we like the sort of the first thing you would think of is like, okay, well, we made decision three at the first condi and decision two at the next condi after that, and so we'll kind of accumulate uh, a log of all the decisions we made at the condi, and that will kind of describe where in the program we end up, and that will, right, that will sort of uniquely determine, you know, because we've we have a log of all the actual decisions made by the program, where in the sort of space of programs we ended up, and if you follow the same trace, you'll end up with the same program, right? Okay. Uh, um, that, yeah. yeah. Gre Greg has a couple of questions here. Okay. Let's see if I can find Chrome again. Uh, Greg started out. Are you saying that given part of an output that you want to fill in some context, the system is learning how to produce that output in a way that's independent of the context? Is this in response to the canonical form encoding input output pairs bit? 
I think the second question is related. Is that okay? Yeah. Earlier part of your explanation, yes. So at the top, learning how to produce quote one two three, you're saying that helps in learning how to produce quote one two three in any context. I guess <coughs> this is going back a few minutes. Okay. So so I, I'm gonna I'll respond to what I think this is asking, and then we can see. Uh, <laughs> so. Um, the intuition here, and this is again something that I haven't implemented yet, so you know, buyer beware. Uh, but the intuition here is that if we take, uh, you know, so, so that if we, if we just learn a model like across kind of a bunch of different programs, it will be a good prior for like weeding out like really dumb programs that you'll never need, no matter what you're synthesizing. Uh, but it will not be as good as a model that is like finely trained for like synthesizing append or list functions or something because it will have to encode a general you know, good program structure for all possible good programs you might want to write. And so it has to like give equal weight to like things that use plus and minus and do arithmetic to things that do you know, cons and cutter and return lists, because those are both like possibly good programs. And so the intuition here is that we want to say, OK, well, suppose we're doing you know, all of our input output pairs tell us that we're unlikely to need any of the arithmetic functions. Can we? kind of fine tune the model so that we can tell it like a little more information at the beginning. So not only does it like screen out all the like ridiculous lambdas, but it can also screen out the arithmetic functions if all of our inputs and outputs are like lists of Jensen. And the uh, reason, and then sort of the way that would work is basically saying, and you know, to get, I think, to your question, that uh, if we give it, you know, so one, two, three there was an example of, let's say that's an example of like one of the inputs or outputs from a pen, right? And all the other examples are like lists of one and two and empty lists and, and things like this. Uh, so the hope here is that if we encode those, we will arrive at an encoding that, <coughs> excuse me, we'll arrive at an encoding that reflects the fact that, you know, list and, and, uh, you know, potentially cons or, or whatever uh, are, are frequently used in deriving these encodings and plus and minus are not frequently used. Uh, and so we'll kind of arrive at an encoding that is likely to bias the interpreter to look more at solutions that use list function and con function, uh, cons function, rather than plus and minus. And so it's not specifically uh, that it's going to be programs that are very good at generating one specific response, although, you know, if you trained it on one specific response and then you would have a thing that, a model that was only good at one specific response, the hope is that you would arrive at an encoding of those one, two, one, two, three lists that, you know, encoded some useful structure about the kind of program we wanted to generate, such as that, you know, if, it, you know, it used a bunch of list functions or it maybe would encode, depending on how you did it, the fact that all of the input and output pairs are lists of the same length, and so it was more likely to like pull math out of its library rather than select, because it's unlikely that you're using select if you're never actually getting a list that's shorter than your examples or something like that. So it's it's kind of like you know a bit up, you know, it's sort of like a bit you know because it's sort of un unbuilt and untested, it can kind of you know be all of these things and work very well in theory. Uh, but that's the hope, if that makes sense. Uh, does that clarify it? I think <laughs> follow-up right. question coming. OK. Is that question coming now, Greg, or I guess later? <laughs> okay, here we go. Okay. Uh, so let me see if I understand how we're how you're training. You attempt to generate data specifically in order to see what kinds of operations are used in the traces of synthesizing data, and then later on when you do program synthesis.
So are you doing something, I guess from that question, it makes me think that it's something like fuzz testing or generation of input so you can get the input output pairs? Not sure. Uh, um, OK, and then, then later, when you do program synthesis, you use that information for the particular input output examples you're given to figure out how to score branches for solving that particular problem. Right. So I'll preface this by saying that since I've only just gotten the kind of like the basic mechanisms of this working, the precise training strategy is still a little bit up in the air. But uh, I, that that is, I think, accurate relative to what I had in mind while building said mechanisms, uh, with the only qualification that I think you probably it probably is already understood implicitly, but I'll just uh, reiterate just in case, is that uh, yes. Uh, that is sort of one el one element of the possible strategy here is okay. So, so let me let me take a step back uh, by saying that so given my kind of previous explanation that there's sort of two kinds of things we can train on. We can train on you know program structures and learn a general bias, and we can also train incorporating encodings of input output data uh, to maybe bias it better for that specific problem represented by that data. Now, give, within that, that still leaves us with the question of kind of how do we get the data, which I think is ki partially what's being asked in this question. And the strategy uh, proposed in said question is kind of one component of the strategy I had in mind, uh, but it's also kind of an area where this is most open, uh, which is to say that you know we have you know one possibility here being that we have a bunch of you know, example programs from, you know, GitHub that we've, you know, pulled down and, and, and cleaned and whatnot that we are taking as sort of examples of good programs. And so you could imagine training on those programs. Uh, you could imagine running those programs in the relational interpreter to generate the data that they generate and then, you know, turning around and using that data as the sort of like the, the encoding for the bias for the second component of the learning strategy. You could uh, also imagine, you know, maybe if you already had uh, the data, you wouldn't need to do that generation step. But you know, it, it does seem that that doing that generation step is kind of what Mini Kenrin should be good at, and it should be a kind of a, you know, it should be something that is, is a very sort of nice feature to have in this training. So that's definitely kind of central to the strategy. And then going beyond that is imagining, well, we don't have, uh, you know, input programs from some GitHub, you know, code base that we got. Uh, but maybe we can, you know, just do the kind of, you know, generate all of it, programs and data, uh, and then just guide the search by, you know, guide the training by some loose heuristic that, for example, you know, programs that can produce the same data but are shorter or score hot more highly than programs that are larger or something like that, where you can just totally unconstrained generate programs and use those programs to generate data and then sort of you know have some very light heuristic across all of that program space that you then kind of turn into a, a specific model for how these traces result in different kinds of programs with different kinds of outputs and see if that you know how how, how well that stacks up against actual you know user requirements of of what we wanted to synthesize if that makes sense and so it's a bit open ended for exactly what combination of strategies will uh, will will we be working here? And I haven't gone far enough into it to kind of have good results on how well those work. But those are all definitely kind of on the table. And I think that's kind of what I understand you to be asking here, uh, asking about. It's, it's sort of unconstrained, but what you've what you've described is definitely one thing that I've had in mind. All right. Yeah, all right. Uh, and so let me see if I can. If there's no other pressing questions, see if I can finish up my my explanation of what the trace is, because I think that's kind of the only kind of bit of potential complexity to this. Everything else, you know, like once you kind of what like seeing what the trace is is the only kind of important thing to know about uh, in terms of what how this sort of sees the. Uh, the, the, the training data from a program and kind of with that everything is very simple. Uh, and so I don't even know, I don't know if this, this his grammar notation helps. I'll just try to sort of go on and, and see if it all makes sense. 
regardless. Uh, so the thing to know about these traces. So if I was to let me grab a trace of a simpler program. <clears throat> so let's get a trace of just the quote. So we're, you know, the, so the program is just like quote 42, right? It's like just a totally constant, basic, like the number 42. Uh, okay, can, can I ask you a question about the notation? Because like, why are there constants there if that's quote 42? <laughs> uh, <laughs> so the uh, small talk does not, by default, or at least Faro, have a you know, a default obvious analog for the uh, Lisp and scheme style cons list. Okay. And there's been really, I think, I mean, maybe someone's written one that I just haven't noticed, but at least a while ago, I don't think there was even a very good linked list implementation, except for one that was like used kind of in deeply in the internal stuff. Although I'm sure that there's like libraries out there that implement linked lists. Uh, and so, but since I was kind of already, you know, needing to, you know, add, you know, List unifications and all this stuff. I uh, just kind of wrote a you know a, a Lisp uh, style list, and the notation I decided to use for it uh, that worked the kind of most neatly was that I gave every other object in the system uh, a cons function. So this is the symbol quote, and, and hash here is a is a symbol like equivalent to a single quote uh, in Scheme. The quote symbol. I'm sending it the message of you know cons with the argument. 42 cons, and that will just create a cons pair of quote and whatever the argument is. And this cons without the colon is being sent to 42, which will just create a, a single cons of 42 with nil. Uh, so this is just the, uh, well, the, okay. the list quote 42 that is. OK. OK, I, I understand now. Yeah. Uh, so, so yeah. So that's the list, and okay. So yeah. So we're gonna grab the. Let's see if we can. Okay. So I think this should be the resultant uh, package returned from just evaluating quote forty two, uh, and its trace is just uh, eval the first condi uh, clause in the eval, which I guess is the quote function, and then into the quote uh, fresh. And that's its whole trace, right? Does that make sense? Uh, so cons is infix in some places and postfix unit in others. I guess that's going to be for the cons. Is the eval one quote? <clears throat> this is just a list of three elements. Eval one quote representing the kind of the linear path we took through the interpreter. We started with the eval function, we picked an element of the condi, and then we ended up at the quote function. That was the end of the program because quote was terminated. So that's the first condi clause in eval, basically, is quote. Yeah. So, so okay. yeah. That I understand. And, yeah. And, and one represents just like the first element of a condi within eval. So it got to the eval function, it got to a condi at which it picked the first branch, it got to the quote. Fresh, I guess, or something. Okay, so then slightly more complicated one would be probably, I don't know, let's grab the empty list here. Oh, All right, so this is just the you know, empty list, right? So the program is just. List cons, which is just the a list of the symbol list, and the trace here is going to be eval third element of the eval condi, which I guess is the list function, which calls the proper list function, which calls the first element of its condi, which I guess just terminates there as the you know this is the empty list, right? Because that's what proper list has a you know condi between an empty list and a, a non-empty list that it does recursively, right? OK. So then adding, well, actually, yeah. So, so maybe. Hmm. 
this would be on the program eval of just the x variable. So this is going to be a variable lookup. And its trace is eval second, I guess. So quote is one, list is three, and lookup is two in eval, because that's how I wrote it. Uh, then the lookup function, and then one, and I guess x is the first element of the environment, so it's done. Make sense? OK, yeah. All right, so now let's, oh yeah, I think this is going to be better than a list of the, of the starting place. So now we get something slightly more interesting. Uh, not very much, but you know. Uh, all right, so now this program is, the, is just the y variable, which I guess is the second element of the, uh, of the environment. And its trace is you know, eval, you know, same two again, look up. Instead of one here, we went with the other lookup because I guess we failed to match the first variable x against y, and then we go into lookup again, and that one matches, and so we get the first branch of lookup, which is succeed, and I guess the second branch of lookup is fail. All Makes right. Sense? So if you had some really long environment and you're looking up the last binding, you're just going to see, you know, lookup two, lookup two, lookup two, blah 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 blah, and then lookup one at the end. Right. 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 Or you might have a lookup fail eventually, I guess. Yeah, I mean, you could you could have any number of things, I suppose. You could have a lookup fail. Well, well, like, what what would you do if if, yeah, if you know, what would it look like for the trace if if it didn't even occur in an environment? Well, wouldn't it be yeah, then the case that you referenced an unbound variable and your tra your program would fail, and so you wouldn't get a trace back? Oh, it's so the whole trace fail. Okay, so so yeah, so this comes back to the fact that you're only getting traces for. For successful evaluations, right? Okay, that's something I think worth considering. You know yeah. whether or not that's ideal. Yeah, no, this, uh, uh, the other thing is maybe we time. want. What's that? Well, I, I was going to say, you know, the other thing that the other way we might approach this is by adding explicit errors to the relational interpreter, so mm -hmm. that you could train on that. Yeah, you know, it's like this, this sort of trace is likely to give you this error as an output or something like that. Yeah, no, there, there's definitely a lot of kind of, you know, I feel like, you know, it feels intuitively like there should be plenty to do with, you know, making use of failures. I just couldn't unify it into like one model with this, and I figured out how this might make sense, and I'm still kind of puzzling over exactly how to do failures. But that's, that's definitely an, a very open area where this could go if someone thinks of how to do that. Okay. Yeah, maybe it's not hard. Maybe it is hard. I don't know. It just hasn't hasn't come to me yet. Anyway. Uh, but yeah. So, so then, yeah. So so given that, uh, you kind of start to see this sequential trace unfolding. And the only thing I want to kind of add to that, which is why I'm using trees and not sequences, which is kind of you know, the main the main difference here, uh, is that. <coughs> The reason we get that sequential, and this is kind of what I was doing this, this grammar notation for, if this helps anyone, because it's, it kind of made sense for me to think about this way, is that lookup only calls uh, lookup or terminates. And so it defines you know, a regular grammar in which there's only this one you know, possible source of recursion on the right. And so, of course, a regular grammar can generate a sequence, uh, a trace that is unambiguously both just a sequence and tells you how many lookups you did and what the result was, right? Because we already, we all, we know from any given trace of a lookup that it was only calling itself and we can see how many times before it succeeded, right? So like if our evaluator was just quote and lookup, sequences would be all we need to have a unique and unambiguous traces that were just sequences that represented every possible execution, right? And the, the reason that you maybe get into trouble there, and this is something that you know maybe there's a different way to look at it, and maybe this is unnecessary, I don't know, uh, but uh, is that if you have something like list, list goes to, or you know, proper list, I guess, technically would be maybe it's happened. Proper list goes to uh, something like you know, eval and proper list. And you know, maybe some, some, some Terminal stuff that it does in the environment. Yeah, I guess eventually gives you empty lists. Uh, yeah, and so the fact that you know, because there are now two 
you know, recursive calls here, uh, this is not going, this is not, you know, the, the sort of the grammar to such as it is, right, that we're, that I'm using to approximate this is no longer regular. Uh, and I mean, it, and, and it may be unambiguous in sort of the interpreter, uh, but for a general sort of case of converting a mini pro, mini Canron program to this kind of tree, uh, to this sort of tree structure, it's not necessarily true that a sequence can uniquely encode a, a unique execution trace. Uh, and so that's the reason I went from sequences to trees, because it's now encoding sort of like you know the hierarchical call where anytime we have a rule that looks like this, where there's a conjunction between two you know things that are you know recursive calls or condies or something, those need to be uh, joined together at the same level of the tree. Those are sort of siblings under the parent tree of a, of, a, of the sequence above them, if that makes sense. Yeah. So that we preserve the full structure of how we got the proper list, and then we have our trace branch, the two children, the left child is the rest of this eval, the right child is the rest of this proper list. And so that should uniquely encode every execution as a tree. Uh, yep. Uh, Lisa has to head out. So thanks for the demo and answering questions. Good thing. Thank you, Lisa. And then let's see. Yeah. So so then if I have a one list lookup here, we get a trace that because we're using list now, should have this extra layer of nested structure where we get okay eval. We're in the list again. Uh, you know, we go through this, it's a, not an empty list, and now we have this uh, nested list here where the first one is an eval that gets down to the quote, and the second child is gets down to that nil proper list like we just sort of saw, right? Okay. And that's, that's you know, and it, it obviously it, it nests as much as it needs to nest to do yeah. that. So, you know, basically the first change I, I make to mini canon is accumulating these tree traces here, which Probably could be a little easier, but isn't really very complicated, uh, just because I, you know, pieced it together as I was figuring out what I was doing. Uh, so, then, so I guess the other thing is, you know, not not only okay. So I guess traces that are you know, you you don't have traces for programs or queries that fail, and I guess currently you don't have partial traces for things that might diverge or go on too long. Is that right? Yes. Nothing that doesn't. Nothing that fails to return a complete answer has a trace yet. OK. Uh, and yeah, so, so then kind of in conclusion, basically to put this in the context of like, you know, the standard mini Canron build, the changes are one, keeping track of that that trace, which probably could be, a, you know, you could probably do it more easily by just doing a sequence. And that would probably be like fine to start with. Or you could go to the trees. I think it's just a, like a difference in potentially in the quality of the model, but it should probably still work in principle either way. And maybe you don't even get that much benefit in Barlman. I don't know. So it might even be easier just to do the sequences, which I'm currently flattening the sequences anyway. Uh, so that's just a, a, you know, keeping accumulating those traces in the packages. Not very complicated. Uh, that's the first step. Second step is just doing the training, which is totally outside of Mini Kenrin. And that's you know standard machine learning problem. You have a bunch of trees or sequences. You want to generate scores. Do whatever you want. Uh, and then the final step is just changing the the, 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 tree, the stream tree into a priority queue, which is very, very simple. You just change the stream code into like an actual reified tree structure. And then you cache some scores in it and have it check them when it does M plus. So that's really all it takes. It's a very kind of small, you know, relatively speaking, I think, Thing to add to Mini Canron, and so it's potentially something that you know. Obviously, I'm going to play around with it a bit more, see what it how it behaves in Smalltalk here. But it will be easy to port if it becomes, if it seems like it will be worth doing at some point. And that's I think all I've got. Unless people have any other questions. Well, thank you. I was wondering if Daniel had any thoughts. Uh, Oh, well, I guess one question I had, and this goes back to me, stuff we talked about with Daniel last time, is um, what about, I don't know if you addressed this, about the self-training, about you know, kind of learning on programs by itself. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, Greg has a question first. Let's see. Just to see if I follow, the branches in your trace tree are formed whenever there are multiple successful answers returned, with the placement of branches where each answer takes a different path. I, I think maybe I'm understanding that correctly. Let me try again here. So the branches are formed. So, so the whole trace represents one single answer. And it has nothing to do with any goal that was not visited by that answer in constructing that answer substitution. Uh, the branches happen anytime we have <clears throat> a function like list where it has two recursive calls here or two condies or two, I don't remember exactly how I defined it, but but basically anywhere where you know lookup can be uniquely defined by a sequence because of its sort of regular structure, if you want to think of it that way. Or because it only calls itself, uh, we just you know, lookup can only you know iterate a bunch of times like you know star, and then have some final constant. But if we have you know this a function like proper list that calls both eval and proper list, basically a conjunction of two condies or of two recursive calls that might make further choices, then in general I don't think we'll be able to represent that as a, a linear trace, and so it just the branches happen anywhere there is a conjunction of two goals that are you know, recursive or can be, basically. Uh, and it may not be necessary, but hopefully if it's not necessary, then yeah, that means something like you wrote your interpreter in a stupid way and should refactor it or something like this. Uh, so, you know, because it's just, things shouldn't sort of delay that you shouldn't, basically you shouldn't have like a bunch of like lazy evaluations that just end in like a constant thing anyway that you could have just Added as a, a constant conjunction early rep. But but yeah, but so the branches are just anywhere there's that conjunction of condies. And so here we get you know eval down through proper list, and then in proper list, at the point where we're evaluating the eval for the car and the proper list for the cutter, that's where we do a branch in the trace. So so your Make traces sense. are basically proof trees, except you're not saying what the constant data in the leaves are, is that right? Yeah, yeah, they're, they're proof trees that, that follow the structure of the function function calls of the interpreter without worrying about what is in the substitution or what the actual meaning of the program is. They're just for whatever mini program you run, whatever function calls it, it follows that the tree captures that call structure. Okay. Cool. Okay, so so my question is, you know. What if you wanted to do some not train on a corpus, but just have the system learn on its own? So, in theory, that's something that I that I think is kind of you know that that, that sort of use case in particular is something that I've had very centrally in mind because that seems like you know. Given that we're adding learning to mini Canon, we sh you know we should be using the fact that it can generate all these examples of good and bad things because that's like, you know, we get that for free, so we might as well use it because it's probably useful. Uh, and so my thought on how to use that productively, which is still only a thought because I, you know, this is kind of a question of like, it should work probably, but like, will it be good? Will it work well? Will it be helpful is kind of what I don't have like the, the sort of the evidence for yet. Uh, but, and you know, obviously it'll probably sharpen exactly how to do this as I actually go to try to do it and discover what I've overlooked in just sort of theorizing about it. But uh, roughly in theory, all that you know I would think we would need is okay, you, so you take your your standard relational interpreter, uh, you generate a bunch of programs, uh, and all you know that that will give you all the traces for those programs. And so all you need to do is decide uh, how do I want to instruct the model to navigate among traces like these, right? So, for example, can I give it, you know, or in one case, one possibility, can I give it a general heuristic like program size uh, to minimize relative to, you know, the output equivalence class it's in, right? So, like, given that this program generates this, the same couple of answers as that program for the same inputs. Uh, which you could presumably find a way to like test with the relational interpreter and, and data generation. Uh, this one's larger than that one, so let's tell the model to like disprefer all the extra paths it took and to only prefer the paths that got us to the shorter one, right? So 
The one option is generate a bunch of programs and score them with a general heuristic and let the model do its thing. Another possibility, and this is kind of like, it seems like there's like a number of different composite possibilities just based on like what we've got to work with, right? Another possibility is that you have some good human programs uh, and you can generate the kind of adversarial thing, you generate a bunch of sort of bad random programs and you score them relative to like the good programs in your corpus and the bad programs out of your corpus. And you can do things like, well, keep, you know, generate a bunch of programs until the programs that I know are good start coming up higher in the search order uh, than you know, these random programs and assume that you know, I have a, a, a reasonable chance of, a, a better chance of generating bad random programs and assume my, the programs I have you know, being good kind of gives me a way to bias that. So it's really just like, you know, what kind of information can we use from human code, from heuristics, from anything that lets us even say when a program is more prom when a partial program is more promising or when a full program is more promising than or is a better program than than some other program uh, and it's pretty it seems like it's pretty expansive the different kinds of information we can incorporate it's like a pretty broad rubric and i think that, that any of them could potentially or all of them in, in combination could potentially be used and so definitely full on program and data generation from mini canron is very central to my my sort of thinking because like, you know, that's what Mini Canron does, and so we should be taking advantage of it. We could just use a, a like a new captcha, right? You know, it's like <laughs> yeah. in order to log into this website or to sign up for this email, you have to tell us which of these programs is better. Yeah, I mean, but like, but actually though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That actually be yeah. Although yeah, talk about uh, well, actually no, because then what you do is you incentivize all of the sort of you know bot farm organizations <laughs> out there who like are you know invest huge dollars in breaking captcha to fund synthesis research. Yeah, exactly. and then you just with them, and they finance all of the work <laughs> on. <laughs> yeah. All right, great. Any other questions or comments about uh, you know, the, the work Evan showed us? I guess I'd like to see a mini Canon version in Scheme at some point. Yeah. Or a O'Canron version. Like I said, it shouldn't uh, take very much. And hopefully, if I can get this version cleaned up and Simplify it down and, and demonstrate that it's useful. Then we can think about where it makes sense to test it with the other stuff. So we'll actually yeah. run back. And I, I need to uh, fix fix up. I guess the uh, also worth asking is where which scheme has like you know, requisite machine learning facilities or whatever. Mm -hmm. Although potentially you could do that in another language entirely and just kind of import the model because it's offline. So a lot of options. Yeah. Uh, Daniel says inverse report, inverse reinforcement learning for a value function of good programs with the generative adversarial network to distinguish good slash human programs from bad ones perhaps might get you that. Okay, I don't know what inverse reinforcement learning is, but uh, it sounds like you're running backwards, so that sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> that is, reinforcement learning is discovering policy. Inverse reinforcement learning is discovering value. OK. Uh, I've got, I've got sort, of this, sort of this fuzzy notion of what we, reinforcement learning is. So Read a little bit about it. I need to read a lot more. So, um, I guess. So, Greg asks. So, in, in inverse reinforcement learning is like using hindsight. And it says IRL is like imitation learning. Is there a canonical example of IRL? Uh, seeing a set of actions, some policy 
that you don't know and trying to derive a value function from it. Hmm. Yeah. Seeing, that is seeing someone do something and trying to figure out their motivation. Oh. Well, I played a game on Friday. It's a game where someone gives you three numbers, and you're supposed to figure out the relationship between those three numbers. And you know, the way you do it is you give three numbers back, and they tell you whether or not those numbers have that relationship. Um, that sounds like an IRL problem. <laughs> Okay. Well, uh, I guess you know the other thought I have is that if we if we fix this kind of unfortunate uh, error in uh, the very simple learning on scheme programs uh, that we implemented and cleaned up before, uh, there's an error where it's like it does a little bit of a cheat because I did an optimization which wasn't sound. Um, but if we have something like that, then It'd be interesting to, to try to see how how these two versions of learning mm -hmm. um, perform. You know, then you know, I guess I guess we can get to start getting to the point where maybe we can start building up benchmarks or or uh, you know try to try to try to start comparing different approaches because it sounds like this is a pretty big space. And yeah, no, I feel like there's a lot of possible and promising combinations of these things. Yeah, that's good. Okay, I know Orchid has a question about Barleman, and I think Dimitri has a question about search order. Um, okay, Orchid, what's your yeah, what's your Barleman question? Screen share that. Okay. I just thought of this. I don't know if it's important or not, but I'd love to hear people's thoughts about it. Okay, so let's see. I generated some random numbers. What if they were the input output pairs for a function f? So f of 76 or 78 gives you 14, f of 63 gives you 19, and so forth. F could be synthesized like this. Define f of x as a cond, x equals 78. Okay. Yep. You could you could uh, definitely do a case on all of the the inputs. That's right. Um, Oops, I made a mistake in my con numbers. Just ignore that. OK. So I guess I'm trying to understand uh, the, uh, what this is trying to show. Are you, say, are you trying to show that you know, if you had a function like the square function, let's say, you're trying to guess the square function, that if you had a whole bunch of pairs of, of numbers, a number, and then the square of the number is the output, that you, know, you could just define you know, a giant con that has, you know, you know ma matches against all the inputs and returns the outputs. Oh, okay. First of all, can we actually synthesize this? Uh, well, potentially. So, so that's interesting because this is sort of the opposite of what we've wanted to do with the recursive stuff, right? So, you know, with the recursive definitions, we've tried very hard to avoid exactly this behavior because um, we want to maybe through a parsimony property or encouraging the search to consider the smaller programs. 
to try to force it into recursion instead of just um, matching on the inputs. Or this is why we use the absento constraints, right? So we'll say that um, you know we want to make sure that we have some sort of gen sim or some some special symbol or some special number as an input, and we're going to uh, you know say that that imp that that value is not allowed to occur within the code. You know, so if we relax all of those restrictions, I think you would get programs like this. And certainly, you could have heuristics that build programs like this. Um, yeah, so this is you know basically a lookup table, right? Yeah, so so I guess another thing you could do is you could specifically have a heuristic, uh, and, and this is the sort of thing you can do if you're synthesizing lots of programs. You know, if you're doing lots of things in parallel, if you had extra cores laying around or something like that, uh, or or this is maybe something that comes out of a user conversation with the tool, right? So, so maybe the user says, "Hey, this isn't recursive," um, or maybe the user says, "I want a lookup table version of it or something like that," and then then it'd be quite easy to synthesize. Uh, recursive programs might require cases like this too, like FizzBuzz. Sure, sure, and you know, I guess you know, you could have a whole bunch of base cases and then some recursive cases, that that sort of thing as well. So that that is an interesting question, and, and I have thought, you know, how would we how would we synthesize FizzBuzz, right? So right now we're not our interpreters don't have arithmetic in them, uh, so that's that's one issue. Uh, we're also, I mean, depending on how you look at FizzBuzz, you know. You might want to handle strings. You might want to handle printing, as opposed to like just building up a list. So, so uh, there may be some data types and some side effects that we're not currently handling, in addition to the arithmetic. But beyond that, if we were to implement those things in the relational interpreter, would would it be difficult to synthesize FizzBuzz? And I don't know. I think it'd be, you know, that's that's one thing that I would like to be able to synthesize. Um, Daniel says, for machine learning, this is why we have training sets and validation sets that are segregated. Only training set is used for creating the model, and you try to avoid a large gap between tra training and validation accuracy. You could have a validation set for, for example, a square function by giving mini Kenron some training set of test cases, but only pass an answer if the function also passes validation cases too. Yeah, so you want to avoid over-specializing. Um, I guess the thing there is you also, at the same time, want to try to avoid generate and test. The, the, other, the other thought, of course, is that um, you know, there are higher level properties, right? So for, for, for a mathematical property, maybe there's some universally quantified property you can give. Or I guess another approach is you, know, you could do something like a, a test a quick check, quick check style thing, where for the validation step, you try a million inputs, and you know, make make sure that those all pass once you think you've got a, a good case. So, um, yeah, but you know, this comes back, I guess, to to a question we've had for a long time: is how well does example based synthesis work? And you know, obviously, there's information like types. Universally quantified properties, properties like quick check, contracts, loop invariants, you know, conversation with the tool, uh, all sorts of other things that you might use uh, to to specify what sort of program you want, whether or not you want the shortest program, whether or not you know values from the inputs and outputs are actually allowed to occur in the program. Uh, let's see. Orchid says a programmer knows when writing append to try recursion on the list. That's right. So that's you know that's something you could either do via heuristics or something you could specify, right? So um, Kanichi SI, for example, has a tool to help students um, learn ML programming or OCaml programming or something like that. And the idea is that this is sort of like a, a web form interface, I think, and the students are supposed to do things like check a checkbox if this definition is going to be recursive or if it uses a helper maybe or how many arguments does it take and what's the type and all that. So uh, 
you know, it's not a synthesis tool. I think it's mostly to try to make them think hard about what it is they're synthesizing. But that's something we could specify, right? Um, because if, if the definition is not recursive, obviously we shouldn't be spending time trying to synthesize recursive calls, right? Yeah, and, and exactly, recurring on the list. That's the other thing. You know, which argument are you going to recur on? Heuristic-wise, if you know that you're taking, you know, for, for, for a pen, there are two lists, so maybe it's not clear. Or something like, uh, you know, member that maybe takes a symbol and a list. You know, you can't really recur on a symbol. It doesn't have structure, but you can recur on a list. And now, uh, you know, you're recurring on a list, so probably going to have a, a null check as a base case. And in the recursion, you're going to be taking the coder of that argument. You know, so there's there's a lot of structure you can immediately figure out, usually just from some heuristics. Or if you look at how to design programs, that also has kind of a similar, similar flavor for this. So you can imagine could, kind of going through those steps uh, with the interface as well. So yeah, so here you'd say, nope, it's not recursive. And you, know, you might want to specify that this is, this is a, the type of program is, um, you know, what we call it, uh, you know, lookup table, or maybe you want to specify that it's not a lookup table. You know, so you you could tell you could tell Barlaman that you know don't just don't just enumerate or you know don't just uh, match all of the inputs to their outputs that that's not you know acceptable. So don't even bother showing me any of those answers. So I, I guess that's another thing you could do is you sort of have some side condition constraint disallowing that type of solution. Uh, well, it doesn't do it yet. <laughs> oh, whoa, 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 sorry, I, I missed that comment. Uh, Greg synthesized it, okay. Let's see, so let's, let's see what Greg has. <clears throat> so Greg actually got it to work. <laughs> That's awesome. Okay, that was that was clever using match. So, so, so Greg, do you think if you use cond, Instead of match, would it be harder? I guess the fact that you you know that you're always matching on X probably um, probably helps also. Yeah. Hmm. Let's see, and the order is the order in which the tests appear. Neat. OK. Um, well, does that answer your question, Orchid? I guess it probably poses more questions than anything else, but at least at least if you use match, that makes it pretty pretty clear. So so Greg, what happens if you don't tell it uh, if you don't tell it to, to use match? If you delete that part, what does it figure out to use match? Okay, so it might not come back. What if you um, what if you tell it match? Well, okay, so I guess if you tell it match, it's going to know that it has to match on X. Is that right? If you just leave the uh, the you know if you just do match dot comma a, does it figure out the rest of the structure? I would think it would figure that out pretty quickly. Yeah, yeah. So that's about the same speed. Oh, that's what you did before? OK, so gotcha. Yeah, there's, you know, I guess there's really only one thing you can match on this of interest, so it doesn't really matter too much. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, Orchids is when Press is able to fill in the match patterns. Well, I guess you know because the match patterns are all, uh, yeah. Knowing you're always matching on the same, the same argument, I guess, makes it really much easier versus a con where it has to figure out for each one what to do. <clears throat> well, okay, so so I'm curious, Greg, if you if you gave a con and you gave it, say, maybe the first or second case, you know, if you give it a couple of cases with the con and tell it to figure out the rest. I mean, we we should be able to get some sense, some idea of uh, how slow or how fast it is. Um, if you feed it, feed in feed it in a few, and it still takes twenty seconds or something. Yeah, so that one's still pretty slow. Yep, looks way slower. Okay, so you had to fill in three of the four clauses before it was equivalent in performance. Yeah. <laughs> We should use this as an example for like a popple paper. It's like, look at our synthesis tool. <laughs> well, that is that is interesting to see how how much better match works. I guess it's not really surprising because those equal tests are kind of expensive. And... That kind of thing, and and each clause now has to be separate. Um, but it does does make me wonder if if there are other examples where maybe we should be using match. Or I guess the other question is: Is there any way to? Well, I mean, maybe this comes back to things like the training, right? Yeah. You know, so here here's a question for the neural net stuff. You know, if if um, say say we you know say Mini Cameron or, or Barlman was able to figure out the match version, right? Um, could knowledge of the match version be useful in you know kind of figuring this version out? I'm not sure. You know, so so it knows the match version or is trained on the match version, and now you start, you know, you write cond instead. Uh, could it help, or you know, with that equal test? I mean, I guess it could just say else, and then do the you know the the match would be kind of the right way to do it. Or uh, so I suppose I just wanted to raise the question of how we program. Uh, how we pick a variable to do case analysis on or recursion sometimes important to try one way and then figure out it's not possible to implement the function that way. Yeah, I mean, obviously, the most useful thing you can do is if you can, you know, the, the, it's very strong if you can refute something, right? If you can say there's no way to do it. Um, that, I think, is hard in general. Aside from just generally weeding out bad programs that make searches take longer. I don't know uh, if there's a whole lot of even kind of shared structure between them that, you know, like like what what you would ask the learning system to learn that would make those two things seem like they were similar, I guess. Hmm. Yeah, and I guess how do you avoid the issue of it's just going to like, yeah, have an else and then do the Basically, you can change something, you know, if it knows that both of those are independently kind of good styles of programs to write, then maybe that can help it focus in those basins a bit more. Um, yeah. I mean, you've added some constraint that you don't want the match version or something. But. 
you know, here is Greg showing that uh, you know we can we can fail uh, if the output doesn't match the input. <clears throat> so that's that's a, a little simple refutation. All right. All right. Well, that was that was a a good question, Arkid. And it, you know, this also goes into sort of the educational things as well. Or if you like saying like flash fill, um, you know, you you also see things like, you know, you, you can imagine having a flash fill type thing, like like flash fill does synthesis in in uh, Excel. You know, you could imagine having a flash fill thing like this, like, hey, I'm going to have a whole a con with a whole bunch of equals. Like, you figure out the rest, right? Um, you know, so it sort of just selects, so like, like this is my schema, or this is this is what I want my code to look like. Don't don't use match or something like that. Just you know, um, you know, the, look, you know, sort of look at the structure of the first line and replicate that or bias that. I guess that maybe that's a way to do it. Is say, okay. Here's the style I prefer. Here's the format I prefer. Um, you know, that, that would be a good, good way, a good thing to figure out. Okay, and I guess uh, the last item on the agenda yeah, is if, if Dimitri is interested in talking about that or describing the problem with. Uh, Search order issues. Hey, Will. Hey. Uh, so I probably should. Um, so I'm hacking search order in our Kinder implementation, and it seems it is very different because uh, the same program seems to uh, do very different count of unifications and because of that we are rather slow and uh, all like optimizations like fast constraints and other stuff doesn't help help well because of the unification count okay so uh, a kind of, um, I want a minimal example, kind of minimal. Um, um, so we have something like a test XXX Evolo, which has uh, some kind of unifications. And the least, least equivalent is. Uh, a little bit less unifications and I added a lot of the bug prints to the both mini canonical implementations and we have their uh, like this and and after the first unification and uh, I will in this scheme, and uh, there we have uh, uh, two bind cases uh, the first unification. All other stuff uh, before the first unification is kind of the same. And I am now looking for the some, some approach to understand why this extra bind helps because it is my only hypothesis why the search difference. Okay. So, and, and were you telling me that, that uh, there's something about the type system or the types 
you know, Canron that makes it not possible to put the spines in exactly the same places? I worked out of this. Okay. I, have, I implemented very, very unsafe streams this in the same or not manner like Scheme does. And you okay. in the faster MK. Okay, so so to your to your knowledge, you have all the binds in exactly the same place and all of the inks and all that and the I M pluses. Think, yes. And yet you're getting different traces and different numbers of unifications. By somehow, yes. I can show the the code itself. I can okay. show okay. you macro expansion in Okanran. I, I guess um, another thing I could think of is you know, their, their uh, binds can come from different places, right? So do you know the context of both of those binds? Like, do you know which operator is producing that particular bind in each case? I, in uh, Okamo, I think I can call it a bugger and uh, put a breakpoint and uh, look for a backtrace. Okay. But in scheme, I don't know. Is it possible? <laughs> maybe, maybe. Actually, uh... actually, I looked into scheme debugger repo, and I didn't even found this uh, very famous uh, step, uh, step into step over debugging stuff. I found only trace related stuff, and. Shea Scheme um, has a debugger that has um, more features than just tracing, but I don't, well, for most of the time, I didn't actually have access to full Shea and, you know, until, before, until it became open source, so I didn't, I, I, I am not a master of the Shea debugger, um, so I'm not sure exactly what it can do as far as that. I, I think a lot of schemers sort of develop somewhat different techniques uh, for debugging scheme programs. So what I guess, Probably the standard thing I would do. So, okay, so one thing you can do in Scheme, of course, is because of things like macros, it's very easy to redefine uh, things. So, so you could redefine bind so that it prints out some information about its context when it gets called. Or but bind is not a macro; it's a function. You can make it a macro. <laughs> anyway, I mean, there, there, there are things like that you can do. I, um, as far as what's the best way to do it, I'm not sure. Um, okay, so, but you're, but you've gone through every definition, and as far as you know, they're the same. I think they are the same. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Um, I had and, some issues with the uh, let, where you uh, define new fresh variables using let, and it seems that in scheme the evaluation order or of uh, tuple elements in the letter uh, it's not uh, it's not defined by the standard that's and right sometimes I have different uh, indexes for different logic variables and it is was annoying and okay. because of that uh, unification can be uh, the same but uh, numbers can be different. And like it the, is the, not outputs, very, the outputs. Yeah, these uh, twelve and thirteen can be different. Sure. I sometimes. So, so one thing you can do is you can change those lets to let stars, mm -hmm. uh, and that will force the ordering. It, it is true in scheme uh, the the order evaluation for bindings within a single let. It's not specified, or the right-hand side evaluation is not specified. Uh, but if you change that to let star, then it will. Uh, you can you can run into trouble though. You have to be a little careful about doing that if there are dependencies, or you, you can introduce accidentally dependencies uh, if you if you just change lets to let stars. So you have to be a little careful. But we can look at something. Yeah, that one should be safe, I think. It seems the same, but the let star shouldn't affect the search order. It only should affect indexes. That's right. Yeah. 
OK. Uh, so, so here's a question for all of these mini Canon experts who are watching. If and you had this expert. and scheme experts, if you've got and tracing experts, um, you've got two implementations of mini Canon in different languages, right? And you're getting somewhat different tracing behavior, but as far as you can tell, the code looks the same in terms of the n plus and binds, and, and the number of unifications is different. What's the best way to try to debug that? So I guess one thing is, you know, <laughs> implement a debugger. <laughs> uh, yeah, if you're in small time, uh, totally. Another possible question will be, can we uh, expand all Lisp scheme matrices and print the text of the program? Because as far as I know, it's not kind. It's not possible because some reasons. Oh, you want to see the expanded text? You mean for the macros? Yeah, for, for all macros. Yes. Because for example, you know, Okama, we can. Um, in clean. So when we run make. We can see the compilation mm -hmm. call. It is um, when that goes, it is here. So we can change change to build directory and copy paste the command line. It will be compile, I think, and we can add. Uh, Switch and it was terribly wrong. Uh, ah, no, this. Uh, or uh, I forgot environment. So it does compilation, and we can do a common switch and get the full output of the code where we have evil, we have inks as the code in faster MK. We can have M plus. Uh, we have scope stuff related to set varval optimization, and more inks, some binds. You got the idea, yeah? Yeah. OK, uh, well, there, there, you can call expand. Uh, that's one thing you can do. Although what it expands, the code it expands to may have to the code you want to read, because it could expo expand to like very, very low level primitive code and scheme. Um, so that's, that's one thing you could do. Another thing you could do is do sort of like the micro canon approach, where instead of having these macros, you define everything as functions. And then you just have a more awkward interface, right? Like, like pretend you're not in Scheme at all, and you know, do it that way. Um, but you have to be careful when you make that change to not end up messing with the search order in any way. Um, Evan so asks. It seems there is no some easy command line switch which will help me. Not to expand the code in the way you're thinking, I think. Um, there are some approaches to try to expand the code uh, to some extent. You know, to, th so the problem is uh, if, you, if you expand the code fully, which is mm -hmm. the default behavior, you're going to get the um, underlying primitives used by Shea Scheme. It might still be useful to look at the expanded code, actually, because then you'll at least see calls to bind and stuff like that. So, you know, have have you tried using expand before? I am not so big scheme hacker. Okay. Uh, so, if you start a scheme REPL and load the file, you know, or 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 you know, yeah. Um, you can expand a call to a macro. Uh, 
It, it is, it is. Bye. Okay. Um, ah, I committed exit in the wrong file. Okay, there you go. Scheme and this. Okay. And expand. Okay. Yeah, so let, let's expand a call to run. So expand quote, you know, left paren. Uh, run star. Let's do something simple. Run star space, you know, uh, in parens q uh, equal equal q five or something like that. Yeah, perfect. Okay. So that's <laughs> that's what it looks like. <laughs> um, you can make it a little easier to read. I'll show you another another thing you could do. So we can type. Um, uh, well, we got something better than that. So, so first of all, all those gen sums are really hard to read. <laughs> so, what we could do is print hyphen gen sum hash f. And hide the uh, so, so hyphen. Uh, so, so the dash print dash gen sum. Uh, yeah, J G E N. Yeah, uh, and then space hash f. Uh, and then right right parenthesis. Uh, yeah, you you want that as a single line. And uh, get, rid of, okay. yeah, get rid of the rest of the line. Yeah. OK, so now you can see you know, that's, that's really what the code looks like. Run, run, run. So maybe one okay. So if you want to do this this sort of expand approach, one thing you could do is for each of the macros, uh, for each of the macro operators, you know, you don't have to expand the whole whole run. You could expand an individual called a con D, for example. So let's let's expand a con D. So if you expand, um, expand quote, you know, con D. Or right, let's let's start with a fresh. That's an easy one. Uh, how about we do a fresh x, you know, something like that, uh, five. Was We'll have a fake body goal or whatever. Sure. Okay. All right. So that's that's what expand does. Or sorry, what, that's what fresh does. So I don't know if that's helpful, but that at least maybe will let you see where the binds and the M pluses really are. Well, I think it will be helpful, yeah. And then we can do, let's do a Condi one real quick. Uh, so we can expand quote Condi, and then uh, let's do one. Uh, well, you don't have to do unification. Here's a trick Dan taught me. Let's do, um, for the first clause, uh, one space two, and then let's do another clause, which is three four. Um, what? Uh, 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 let's do square brackets again. Another uh, three four. Yep, and then close it off. Let's see how that expands. So you don't actually have to give it something legal. This is this way you can see. You know what the one, two, three, fours are. That that tells you those were where, those are where the the sub goals would go in those clauses, right? Um. Yeah, <laughs> it starts getting long. And of course, it's somewhat longer because you have the debugging code and all that sort of thing in there, right? Yeah. So. You might want to do it on just kind of the vanilla. You might want to expand just the vanilla version of faster MK. Hmm. I think it is what I expected to look like. Okay. I did some manual expansion code and it was painful. 
yeah. I mean, it's kind of painful to look at anyway, but it's definitely much more painful to do it by hand. Um, you know, another thing Evan pointed out is, you know, is there a minimal program on which the answers differ? So I think you're doing logo or something like that. Is that right? Uh, the minimal program is uh, uh, evaluating a first client where some parts of client term are removed and some parts of eva are removed. Okay, so that's Always. a very complicated program, right? Is there anything? Yeah, I, I tried to append the stuff and last, uh, last day I tried it, they were okay. Okay, so so for all simpler programs, uh, probably the number of unifications? All, probably not for all, but it is the most simple I can show you. Okay, so so I guess um, there are all those tests from the reason schema, you know, that go all the you know, like the arithmetic tests all the way up to logo or a logo and expo and things like that. So have have you checked that for all of the tests in the reason schema that you can run that the number of unifications match? Of course not. <laughs> Okay, that's the first thing I would try because you know, um, and that's something you could probably do in an automated way, right? You know, so you could run all those tests and then for each test have it print out uh, the number of unifications and do that for both implementations. And then, you know, if you find any, you know, if you find one where the number of unification unifications differs, hopefully you can find one that's simple, but. You know the the relational interpreter and the clients and all that. You know that's stuff that I I find hard to to think about in terms of the, this sort of thing. So um, so I, I guess things you could do is try try running all of the simple tests from the book. Uh, mm -hmm. Check the number of unifications. Hopefully you'll find something simple that that differs, and then maybe you can keep simplifying that. Uh, try and expand all of the macros with the vanilla version of faster MK where you haven't added the debugging checking, just make sure that that, that code looks like what, what you expect. Mm -hmm. um, and since you can actually see what code you're getting in Ocanran or o OCaml, I wonder if you actually have a real program, like a real Condi fragment, if you can sort of compare that expanded code to the code you get in OCaml. And I wonder uh, if, what like. Do you, what do you mean the real Condi? Well, we were doing Condi of, you know, one, two, three, four, right? So that's not a real program fragment. Uh -huh. But if, if you find the program where the behavior differs, right, and hopefully a simple one, you could literally take out, you know, a Condi clause and expand it. And maybe do something similar with OCaml with OCameron, and, and try to check that those two fragments are identical. If, I, I don't know if that would work. Uh, if the OCameron code would print out in in a way that really would be identical in terms of where every bind is and things like that. But those are a couple. Uh, go ahead. What was the minimal program that was mentioned thus far? Uh had to do with the, the quine generating interpreter. With some stuff removed. So it is what uh, this is evil. Yeah, so to, to me, this is one of the more complicated programs. Um, so if it'd be possible to find something simpler from the reason schema, let's say, or you know, one of those tests that's less complicated, because you know, I, I, I would have real difficulty, I think, tracking down the differences in, in that code is just complicated. OK. Uh, I guess the other thing you could do is if you can figure out, you know, so, so you could add enough printing information um, to the scheme execution, you know, because you can, you can use, you know, project and things like that um, so that you can print out yeah, I know about project, but uh, some difference come after the first unification. Project will not be very helpful there. Is that the first unification? Is that it's early? First, it's first unification, yeah. Oh, wow. Okay. 
Well, I don't know. Maybe, maybe that is possible then to track it down. It's uh, that seems extremely, extremely soon. Yeah. It's really for verification. Okay. Do you do you know what is that? So that's in the quote line. What is that, hand, is that in the handling of quote? Is that that line you're? Yeah, you're... it is uh, line two hundred sixteen. Okay. This unification. Um. Which is can, can we version. look? Can we look at the mini Canon version on the right? In the scheme version of the interpreter on the right, can I just take a look at those real quick and see? Okay, we got fresh tea and um, six, seven. So you had to tag, or I guess you had to tag the mini Canon version to match seek symb quote quote versus. Okay, so so you know that quote quote is a list, right? Uh, quote quote. Uh... Okay, so so yeah, so you know that like the quote the tick mark is shorthand, right? Maybe this might be part of it. So if you go back to the REPL. Let's just make sure you you're familiar with this thing. Uh, you are talking about equivalence between yeah. this and uh, this. Uh, no, those aren't equivalent. So, so if you do, uh, yeah, if you do, and if you do QOT of list, you get that. Uh, not. Yeah. So, so um, quote the quote mark of Q O T E is okay. Okay, but what you wrote doesn't doesn't have a doesn't have parens around it. It's just a quoted symbol, right? Yeah. So that I think yeah, and Q O T E of quote yeah. So those two things are the same, right? So, so what you what you have in the code is equivalent to that list Q O T E Q O T E. Um, I just wanted to make sure you're you're aware of that. I don't know if that has anything to do with what's going on, but I notice in the other case you just have, um, you know, a string, right? So. We basically use uh, strings uh, everywhere we are. You use quotes, or okay. not, not quotes, uh, symbols. Okay, I think it'd be fine in this case. I just want to make sure you understood that. Um, and then the T. Okay. Uh, here you have what? Is that a disequality constraint on the left? Yeah. Okay. Why? No. Uh, you no. no Unification. Does this why? doesn't does a simple program of like a quote and nothing with no other stuff in it? Does that? Uh, Fail the same way, or is it only failing in the context of a larger program? Uh, are you proposing to remove something from the program? I just mean if we're if we're looking at the in the implementation of quote, do we know just a simple program of like quote and some constant? Does that fail with whatever the fail metric we're using is? You mean the unifications uh, differing? Yeah. That's a good question. You know, is there is there a super super simple expression that uses quote that has different traces between the two interpreters? I mean, if, if quote seems to be where it might be going wrong, maybe you can just run very you know, evaluate very very simple quote expressions and see if those have any difference in behavior. I don't even think that. Uh... It is a matter of what we are trying to unify. Oh, really? Yeah. Uh, what what is the three equals versus versus three equals in a in an explanation point? Uh, so uh, 
basically we have unification which is uh, three equals and it is kind of polymorphic that works for uh, all types but uh, there I have some hacks where I use unit race the same unification but which prints uh, what is being unified it is uh, I manually pass this function which is a ray fire switch printer so in order to support um, different unif unifications with the different types and different printers I need to add some operators that are named differently so okay. basically this uh, triple equal explanation mark is uh, tracing unification which with this uh, shower slash ray fire for a result type which is either closure or uh, a vowel which is called vowel there and closure there so it is basically the same unit uh, unification plus tracing plus different uh, printer so, so I, I've got a question because it's failing so quickly if you have a Val Expo only have that first you know quote clause does it still differ in, in the trace you know yeah if you comment everything else out except for the first clause do you still get a difference in tracing you know I wonder wonder if you can simplify what's going on that way uh, where am I? Why took me? And do those differ? There's two different here. Okay. Um, in, in the same spot. They differ in the same spot, okay. So because we cut the all other stuff, it's not. Uh, I'm not uh, very sure that the problem is here, but it's very likely that it is really here. And because we cut all other stuff, the unification count is kind of the same. You notice that. Um. So. It is uh, very likely the minimal, but as far as I remember, if it makes this, everything should be fine, or I don't think it has to. There is no bind here. So the existence of these branches matters. Okay, so, so I guess is it the not an info, or is it the unification of the R? I mean, can you, yeah. Oh, I closed the terminal. Touch. I mean, um, you should also be able to remove the con D at that point, probably, because there's only one clause, right? So if there's only one clause, you can get rid of the con D. So you should be able to come up with a really, really simple expression. It's basically a function and a single unification or two unifications. I think you should be able to come up with a really short program that shows the difference. And that that's something maybe you can expand in Scheme and help understand what's going on in that way. They come out with different answers or just different numbers of unification? unification? Uh, in this case, uh, there is no answer at all. So the answer, answer is the same. Because they could have different numbers of unifications if they just tried conduct in different orders and stuff, right? And or, I mean, depending on what you're counting the unification as, is it like, is that every time the unification anywhere fires, or is that like some number in the return value? Well, the exercise is to try to make the traces identical because they're, they're trying to, to oh. understand what the performance is. It right? seems they, they become identical. What we just do? So, you, so you're not doing the recursive call to not an invo, right? Or we don't do more than two causes. Yeah. 
it doesn't depend on recursion, I think. It is okay. uh, the only case about clauses. Because as far as I remember, bind, were, bind has uh, a case for one element in the list and the second case for more than one element. So it's kind of expected. All right. I, I don't know how to understand this output. So, so, so we're getting, you know, you're getting different behavior when with, with the, <clears throat> the unification of R commented in, or sorry, you know, in the program or with the, the not an info. I don't have one bind here. Let's um, I think the second clause. No, it is not. My, my understanding is uh, you've taken enough care that you should get exactly and the same traces, right? Like they should be identical. Is that right? Like the order in which everything happens, the order of the condi clauses, the order of the unifications, everything should be identical. It's like, is that your understanding? So programs, programs outputs are different in many ways they can do different kinds of unifications. It is obvious that they are different. Okay. And they do can do the same amount of unifications, but in the different order. And okay. it is not very easy to suppose they are really different. So, so why would it be in a different order? And probably because of this extra bind with, that we have seen. And the programs can do the same amount of unifications in the same order, but we ex with extra cause of bind. We okay, so, so I think the thing, yes, yeah, the, the bind I think is the missing thing, right? Because, you know, if you can get it, I mean, the good thing is if, if the order changes at all, that should point you to where the bind is. So that's where they differ, is where it says bind first case. Yeah, it is after the first unification. Okay. So, so when, th yeah. It's, well, it seems when we come in second case in Kandi, everything goes better. I have only one bind here. And it probably will be the same in him. <coughs> Um, oh. Two bytes and scheme in front of the same. Well, I think the way I would approach this is I would go in scheme, I would look at all of the operators that use bind. Mm -hmm. And I would have them print out what the operator is, you know, ha have them print out some context, like which operator it's occurring in, um, just before bind is called, so that hopefully you can understand when you see that bind one thing um, where that's coming from. I mean, because you know, my understanding is that your operators should have exactly the same structure as the mini canon operator, the faster mini canon operators in terms of, you know, where every single bind is. So I believe you know, there so. aren't that many operators that have bind, right? Um, there are only a few operators that have bind. So, so if you can track it down to figure out which which of the definitions or which of the macros has the extra bind. Then you can expand that definition and you know try to dig in a little bit deeper. 
And I think you're pretty close to being able to write a very short program from scratch that shows this difference in behavior. You're able to comment out most of the code. And some of the code you're not even using, like, you know, not an invo you're not using, lookup o you're not using. You know, so so most of the code in that file actually isn't even being run at this point. So you could open up a, you know, you could create a new file that only had you know, 10 lines in it or something probably and see the difference in, in tracing. Um, so, so I would, yeah, I, I would follow Evan's advice and try to come up with the absolute shortest program you can where you see any difference at all in the traces <clears throat> in terms of the ordering. And, you know, um, hopefully you can get that down to like a five line or 10 line program and, and add some printing information and scheme to figure out exactly which uh, which of the operators has a difference in, in a structure and, and use that expand thing that we were using to kind of trace it, trace a little bit more. So combination of expand and minimal programming will help me. It's your prediction. I'm here. I think so. I mean, at some point you're going to get down to almost no code at all. Or, or the other thing I said is, you know, you could, you could literally get rid of the macros, right? You could replace the macros with functions, um, and then you'd be able to, you know, then then you wouldn't have to worry about the macro part of it. Your interface would have to change a little bit. Uh, it, but but your interface would probably be closer to the Ocanron interface. So for example, you, you'd have to do things like we do in Micro Canron, where instead of having run as a macro, you would have run as a function and you would pass a lambda to it, you know, to do the binding of the variable, that kind of thing. Um, you know, that's that's maybe a little annoying, but but I think there's some ways you could remove all of that uncertainty. Uh, mm -hmm. But I, but I think the main thing is just get it down to the absolute smallest program you can get that shows any difference in the ordering. And you know, as you've already noticed, that things like the order of let evaluation uh, is unspecified. So you have to be careful that if there are lets with multiple bindings, that you know, you probably have to turn those to let stars and all that to to make sure that you know exactly the order in which everything's happening in Scheme. But um, Yeah, so if a value is a function, so so that one's not going to uh, uh, give you anything particularly interesting. So I should uh, manually expand the body of the eval. Uh, yeah, once you get a value short enough, then I think you could manually expand it. So basically, I should substitute it. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah. Why don't you try expanding that and see? Let's see what that looks like. Uh, and yeah, can you turn the uh, the print gensums off? Hash F. There you go. Um, uh, okay, there you go. It's very annoying, Ripple. <laughs> Yeah, this is why I always run an Emacs. <laughs> I find it annoying as well. <sighs> okay. Uh, it is a lot of log here. Yeah, a lot of it's logged in code. Okay. Well, let's see. Where where are are there any binds? I see two nested binds. We have. We should have candy, which is. Uh, we have fresh. Fresh creates new variable. Yeah. And then. Uh, lock lock. I 
uh, we have bind of bind. Okay, so you have two binds, and, and can you tell in your, um, I mean, is, is this code that differs in behavior between uh, the OCanron and, and, the, and the scheme? I think so, yeah. Okay, so, so does, I guess, is there a way for you to tell an OCanron whether or not you have that nested bind structure? You, you want have to see the expanded macro for OCanron? Yeah, and that expanded code you had, you showed us, does it have those two nested binds there? <clears throat> One bind and second bind. OK. Uh, I see unification. I see another unification. I see find unification. Unific uh, hold on a second. I don't think those are the same. Well, I'm not sure. Maybe I'm not reading the syntax right. So, so is there a problem with uh, associativity? Or, sorry, uh, yeah, all right, let's see. So, so you have bind of bind of unification, of unification. And here well, you I have. You have uh, left associative bind here. Yeah, so, so is the associativity uh, different between these two? It seems you have left associative bind. Yeah, and, and you have right, a conjunction of a list of goals. Yeah, so is your associativity different? Different? It seems that it is different. Thank you, Evan. Well, I think that might explain the difference. Uh, can I fast fix this? Yeah, why don't you try that real quick? I have to go in a couple minutes, but if you want to try fixing that real quick we'll, or changing it, we can see if that changes behavior, I guess. We can manually rewrite the code, I think. OK. Uh, there is crashed crap. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> It doesn't happen when I am not on Hangout. <laughs> yeah, Greg uh, says, Less, left associativity helps promote promising branches that should catch up to initial promising branch. So that seems to make things faster. So that might also be a reason that your implementation doesn't seem to be as fast. So we, we, we seem to have learned that less left associativity of bind is really important. Uh, you mean uh, right associate? No. Well, wait. I don't, I don't know how to call it. <laughs> we, we do bind of bind of equal equal rather than bind of equal equal bind. Uh, uh, I don't think it is important, but OK. It is the. If you look at Greg's comment uh, in, in the uh, Hangout, he shows you what, we, what you want. This is the. Code, we should copy this and open the left bind, left bind, and put it in the same. So it is useful, and we have ink bind and how should we do this? We should have, uh, so you have left associative bind. So this should go uh, no, 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 this, yeah. And now we have failed the order of unifications. It should be... Uh, Does that look good, uh, everyone? I'm having trouble, a little trouble reading the syntax, but but yeah, you want bind of bind, so that part looks right. 
Uh, I'm just not sure about these unifications up there. So basically, we should do like 216, then 17, then 18. And first two unifications should go with uh, with nested bind, and the result of this bind should be the first argument for the outer bind, right? Does that look right, Derman? So unification, uh, so we have two, three goals. The first two should be conjuncted in the nested result, and the result of bind should be binded with the third goal. I think, goal. I think you have it right. I think that's right. Now, I guess the other question is, you know, do you have other ones that are like that? But, but at least for right now, we can try to see if this one, if it uh, makes these, these the same. Make uh, something is terribly wrong. Ah, uh, it's a uh, parenthesis madness. No. Uh, it's okay. I will do it myself later tomorrow, and I'm very very glad that uh, we have found something something that can be possibly the reason of this. Terrible. Yeah, that, that that would definitely point to a difference in behavior. Okay, and it, and I, it could also we we have found that having left le, uh, le, uh, bind bind, it, you know, in, in that left us or. Left, to, left bind, left bind, or however you want to say it, um, does seem to improve the performance in practice. It does seem to make a difference. So that might speed up Ocanron also. Mm -hmm. OK. Yeah, hopefully it will. All right, good. Well, progress made on multiple fronts today. Uh, thank you very much, everyone. Um, and I guess. Uh, Hopefully see people next week. All right, thank you. All right, I'm gonna end the hangout now.